We Are One Body Audio Theater presents Sherlock Holmes and the Woman by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his eyes, she eclipses every other woman. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, uh, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen. But as a lover, he would have placed himself in a false position. And yet there was but one woman to him, and that woman was Irene Adler. I had seen little of Holmes lately. My marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness and the home-centered interests which rise up around the man who first finds himself master of his own establishment were sufficient to absorb all my attention. However, one night I was returning from a journey to a patient, for I had now returned to civil practice, when my way led me through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again, and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. His rooms were brilliantly lit, and even as I looked up, I saw his tall, spare figure pass twice in a dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. <laughs> to me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was at work again and was hot upon the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and was shown up to the chamber which had formerly been in part my own. Ah, Watson, Wedlock suits you. I think you've put on seven and a half pounds since the last time I saw you. Come now, Holmes, surely not. Indeed, seven pounds. I should have thought a trifle more. And in medical practice again, I observe. What? How did you know? If a gentleman walks into my rooms smelling of iodine, with a bulge in his pocket showing where he has secreted his stethoscope. I must be dull indeed not to pronounce him an active member of the medical profession. <laughs> when I hear you give your reasons, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself. Though at each successive point, I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so. You see, my dear Watson, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. Ah, but since you are interested in these little problems of mine, perhaps you may be interested in this letter. It came by the last post. Yeah, read it aloud. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> uh, there will call upon you tonight at a quarter past eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of great importance. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted with delicate matters. This account of you we have from all quarters received. Uh, be in your chamber then at that hour and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. Curious, is it not? What do you imagine it means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. I have the letter itself, however. What do you deduce from it? Uh, hmm. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Uh, such paper could not be bought under half a crown a packet. 
it is peculiarly strong and stiff. Precisely. Furthermore, the man who wrote the note was a German. How on earth do you deduce that? Notice the peculiar construction of the sentence. This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a German, a Russian or a Russian could not have written that. It is only the German who is so uncourteous to his verbs. It remains, therefore, to discover who this German is, what he wants, and why he prefers wearing a mask. Ah, ah and here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to resolve all our doubts. Uh, I think that I had better go, Holmes. I won't hear of it, Watson. Stay where you are. This promises to be interesting. It would be a pity for you to uh, miss it. But uh, your client. Never mind him. I want your help, and so may he. Here he comes. Sit down in that armchair, Doctor, and give us your best attention. Do come in. Do you have my notes? I told you that I would call. Pray take a seat. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as the Count von Kram, a bohemian nobleman. I understand that this gentleman, your friend, is a man of honor and discretion, whom I may trust with a matter of the most extreme importance? Of course. Then I must begin by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time, the matter will be of no importance. At present, it is not too much to say that it is of such weight that it may have an influence upon European history. I understand. Uh, and I promise. Good. You will excuse this mask. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you. And I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly of my own. I was aware of that. The circumstances are of great delicacy. To speak plainly, the matter implicates the grace house of Ornstein, hereditary, the kings of Bohemia. I was aware of that also. And now, if your majesty would condescend to state your case, I should be better able to advise you. What? How did you know? Uh, but you are right. I am the crown prince. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed. Your majesty had not spoken before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gottreich Sigismund von Ormstein, Grand Duke of Kasselfelstein, and hereditary prince of Bohemia. But you can understand that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person. Yet the matter was so delicate that I could not confide it to an agent without putting myself in his power. I have come in Canido from Prague only for the purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult. The facts are briefly these. Some five years ago, during a lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known Ventress, Irene Atla. The name is no doubt familiar to you. I have heard of her. Born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Prima donna in the Imperial Opera of Warsaw, but now retired from the operatic stage. I believe she's living in London currently. Your Majesty has become entangled with this young person. Wrote her some compromising letters and is now desirous of getting them back. Is that not the case? Precisely so, but how? Was there a secret marriage? Nine. No legal papers or certificates? No. Then I fail to follow, Your Majesty. If Miss Adler should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is my handwriting. Forgery. My private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. We, we were both in the photograph. Oh dear, uh, that is very bad. Your Majesty has committed an indiscretion. I was mad insane. I was only Crown Prince then. I was young. The photograph must be recovered. 
Uh, we have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay have ransacked her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice she has been waylaid in the street. There has been no result. No sign of the photograph. Absolutely none. Hmm. It seems a, a pretty little problem. But a very serious one to me. Indeed. And what does she propose to do with that photograph? To ruin me. But how? I'm about to be married. So I have heard. To Clotilde Lotwin von Saxon Minigan, second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. You may know the strict principles of her family. She is herself the very soul of delicacy. A shadow of doubt as to my conduct will bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler? Then to send the princess the photograph. And Irene will do it. I know that she will do it. She has the soul of steel, the face the most beautiful of women, and the mind of the most ruthless of men. Rather than I should marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she will not go. You are sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the patroller was publicly proclaimed. That will be next Monday. Ah, then we have three days yet. That is very fortunate, as I have one or two matters of importance to look into just now. Your Majesty will, of course, be staying in London for the present. Certainly. You will find me at Longham Hotel under the name of the Count von Kram. Then I shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress. Fred do so. I shall be all anxiety. Yes. Uh, and then as to money. <clears throat> There are 300 pounds in gold and 700 in notes. And Mademoiselle's address? Rainy Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Then good night, Your Majesty. And I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. Good night. Good night. And good night to you too, Watson. It is late, but if you will be good enough to drop to our, tomorrow at three o'clock in the afternoon, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. At three o'clock the next day, I was at Baker Street, but Holmes had not yet returned. The landlady informed me that he had left the house shortly after eight o'clock in the morning. I sat down beside the fire, however, with the intention of awaiting him, however long he might be. I was already deeply interested in his inquiry. It was close upon four before the door opened, and a drunken-looking groom, ill-kempt and side-whiskered, with an inflamed face and disreputable clothes, walked into the room. Accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers in the use of disguises, I had to look three times before I was certain that it was indeed Holmes. With a nod, he vanished into the bedroom, whence he emerged in five minutes, tweed-suited and respectable as of old. Putting his hands into his pockets, he stretched out his legs in front of the fire and laughed heartily for some minutes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> well, really. Uh, what is it? Oh, it's too funny. I'm sure you could never guess how I employed my morning or what I ended up doing. I can't imagine. I suppose that you have been watching the habits and perhaps the house of Miss Irene Adler. Quite so. But then things became rather odd. I left here a little after eight o'clock this morning in the character of a groom out of work. There is a wonderful sympathy in Freemasonry among horsey men. Be one of them, and you will soon know all there is to know. I soon found Briony Lodge. It is a bijou villa with a garden at the back, but built out in front right up to the road, two stories high, 
chub lock to the door, large sitting room on the right side, well furnished, with those long windows almost to the floor, and those preposterous English fasteners that any child could open. In the back there was nothing remarkable, save that the hall window could be reached from the top of the coach house. I walked round the house and examined it closely from every point of view, but without noting anything else of interest. I then lounged down the street and found, as I expected, that there was a muse in a lane which runs by one wall of the garden. I lent the ostlers a hand, rubbing down their horses, and received in exchange tuppence, two fills of tobacco, and as much information by as I could desire about Miss Irene Adler. And what did you learn? Oh, she has turned all the men's heads down in that part of the city. She is the daintiest thing under a bonnet on this planet. Uh, she lives quietly, sings at concerts, drives out at five every day, and returns at seven sharp for dinner. Seldom goes out at other times except when she sings. Has only one male visitor but sees a good deal of him. He is dark, handsome, and dashing. Never calls less than once a day, and often twice. He is a Mr. Godfrey Norton. When I had listened to all the cabman had to tell, I began to walk up and down near Bryony Lodge, once again to think over my plan of campaign. And what did you come up with? All in good time, Watson. Now, this Godfrey Norton, was evidently an important factor in the matter. Uh, he was a lawyer. That sounded ominous. What was the relation between them? And what the object of his repeated visits? Was she his client, his friend, or possibly his mistress? If the former, she had probably transferred the photograph into his keeping. If the latter, it was less likely. On this issue, uh, depended whether I should continue my work at Bryony Lodge or turn my attention to the gentlemen's chambers. And what did you do? Well, I was still balancing the matter in my mind when a cab drove up to Bryony Lodge and a gentleman sprang out. He was a remarkably handsome gentleman, dark, aquiline, and moustached, evidently the man of whom I had heard. He appeared to be in a great hurry shouted to the cabman to wait and brushed past the maid who opened the door with the air of a man who was thoroughly at home. He was in the house about half an hour and I could catch glimpses of him pacing up and down, talking excitedly and waving his arms. Of her, I could see nothing. Presently he emerged, looking even more flurried than before as he stepped up to the cab. He pulled a gold watch from his pocket looked at it earnestly. Drive to the devil, he shouted. He hit the driver to the church of St. Monica in Edgware Road. Half a guinea if you do it in 20 minutes. And away they went. And I was just wondering whether I should not do well to follow him. When up the lane came a neat little carriage. It had not pulled up before Miss Adler shot out of the hall door and into it. I only caught a glimpse of her at the moment, but she was a lovely woman with a face a man might die for. The Church of St. Monica, she cried, and half a sovereign if you can reach it in 20 minutes. What the devil? What indeed, Watson. This was quite too good to lose. I was just balancing whether I should run for it or whether I should jump on to the back of her carriage when a cab came up the street. Well, the driver looked twice at such a shabby fare, but I jumped in before he could object. To the ch Church of St. Monica, said I, and half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. My cabby drove fast. I don't think I ever drove faster, but the others were there before us. The cab and the carriage with their steaming horses were in front of the door when I arrived. I paid my cabman and hurried into the church. There was not a soul there, save the two whom I had followed and a clergyman who seemed to be expostulating with them. They were all three standing in a knot in front of the altar. I lounged up the side aisle, like any other I... 
Suddenly, to my surprise, the three at the altar faced round to me, and Godfrey Norton came running as hard as he could towards me. Thank God, he cried. You'll do. Come, come. What in the world? Exactly what I said, Watson. Come, man, come, Mr. Norton said. Only three more minutes, or it won't be legal. Oh, I was half dragged up to the altar, and before I knew where I was, found myself mumbling responses which were whispered into my ear, and vouching for things of which I knew nothing and generally assisting in the secure tying up of Irene Adler to Godfrey Norton. Well, I never. It was all done in an instant. And there was the gentleman thanking me on the one side, and the lady on the other side, while the clergyman beamed on me from the front. <laughs> it was the most pre preposterous I have ever found myself and it was the thought of it that started me laughing just now. It seems there had been some formality about their license, and the clergyman absolutely refused to marry them without a witness of some sort, and my lucky appearance saved the bridegroom from having to sally out into the streets in search of a best man. The bride gave me a sovereign, and I mean to wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. Oh, this is a very unexpected turn of affairs. What happened then? Well, I found my plans very seriously menaced. It looked as if the pair might take an immediate departure, and so necessitate very prompt and energetic measures on my part. At the church door, however, they separated, he driving back to his chambers and she to her own house I shall drive out in the park at five as usual, she said, as she left him. I heard no more. They drove away in different directions, and I went off to make my own arrangements. Which are? Well, Doctor, that is where you come in. Oh, I, I shall be delighted. I was sure I might rely on you. But what is it you wish? Miss Irene, or Madame, rather, returns from her drive at seven. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And then what? You must leave that to me. I have already arranged what is to occur. Uh, there is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may. You understand? I am to be neutral. You are to do nothing whatever. Uh, there will be probably some small unpleasantness. Do not join in it. It will end up in my being conveyed into the house. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting room window will open. You are to station yourself close to that open window. Yes. You are to watch me, for I will be visible to you. Yes. And then when I raise my hand, you will throw into the room the smoke rocket and will at the same time raise the cry of fire. You quite follow me? Entirely. That is excellent. I think perhaps it is almost time that I prepare for the new role I have to play. He disappeared into his bedroom and returned in a few minutes in the character of an amiable and a simple-minded clergyman. His broad black hat, his baggy trousers, his white tie, his sympathetic smile, and his general look of benevolent curiosity were pure genius. It was not merely that Holmes changed his costume, his expression, his manner, his very soul seemed to vary with every fresh part that he assumed. The stage lost a fine actor, even as science lost an acute reasoner when he became a specialist in crime. As we were both ready to proceed, I followed my friend out into the street and we made our way to the home of Irene Adler. Ah, here we are, the house of Miss, or should I say, Madame Irene Adler. 
but I thought the Duke said it had been burgled before. Cha, they did not know how to look. But how will you know how to look? I will not need to. What? I will get her to show me. But she will refuse. She will not be able to refuse. But I hear the rumble of wheels. It is a carriage. Now carry out my orders to the letter. As he spoke, the gleam of the side lights of a carriage came round the curve of the avenue. As it pulled up to the house, one of the loafing men at the corner dashed forward to open the door in the hope of earning a penny, but was elbowed away by another loafer who had rushed up with the same intention. A fierce quarrel broke out, which was increased by the two guardsmen who took sides with one of the loungers. A blow was struck, and in an instant the lady who had stepped from her carriage was at the center of a little knot of flushed and struggling men who struck savagely at each other with fists and sticks. Holmes dashed into the, the crowd to protect the lady, but just as he reached her, he gave a cry and dropped to the ground with the blood running freely down his face. At his fall, the guardsmen took to their heels in one direction and the loungers in the other, while a number of better dressed people who had watched the scuffle without taking part in it, crowded in to help the lady and to attend the injured clergyman. Irene Adler had hurried up the steps. But she stood at the top with her superb figure outlined against the lights of the hall looking back into the street. Is the poor gentleman much hurt? Uh, no, no, it, it's nothing. I, oh, oh, my head. Oh, you can't lie there in the street. Here, come into my sitting room. There is a comfortable sofa. This way, please. Slowly and solemnly, she helped him into Bryony Lodge, while I still observed the proceedings from my post by the window. The lamps had been lit, but the blinds had not been drawn, so that I could see Holmes as he lay upon the couch. I do not know whether I was seized with compunction at that moment for the part I was playing, but I know that I never felt more heartily ashamed of myself in my life than when I saw the beautiful creature against whom I was conspiring, or the grace and kindliness with which she waited upon the injured man. And yet, it would be the blackest treachery to Holmes to draw back now from the part which he had entrusted to me. I hardened my heart and took the smoke rocket Holmes had given me from my pocket. Holmes had sat up upon the couch, and I saw him motion like a man who is in need of air. A maid rushed across and threw open the window. At the same instant, I saw him raise his hand, and at the signal, I tossed my rocket into the window with a cry of fire. The word was no sooner out of my mouth than the whole crowd of spectators joined in with a general shriek of fire. Thick Clouds of smoke curled through the room and out at the open window. I caught a glimpse of rushing figures and a moment later the voice of Holmes from within assuring them that it was a false alarm. Slipping through the shouting crowd, I made my way to the corner of the street and in ten minutes found my friend's arm in mine as we walked away from the scene of the uproar. He walked swiftly and in silence for some few minutes until we had turned down one of the quiet streets, which led towards the Edgeware Road. You did it very nicely, Doctor. Nothing could have been better. It is all right. You have the photograph. I know where it is. And how did you find that out? She showed me, as I told you she would. I am still in the dark. Everyone in that street was in my pay, of course. When the row broke out and I was hurt defending her, she was bound to invite me in. What else could she do? And into her sitting room, which was the very room I suspected. 
I motioned for air, the maid opened the window, and then you did your part. But how did that help you? It was all important. When a woman thinks that her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing which she values the most. It is a perfectly overpowering impulse, and I have more than once taken advantage of it. A married woman grabs at her baby. An unmarried one reaches for her jewelry box. Now, it was clear to me that Irene Adler had nothing more important in that house, more precious to her than that photograph. The alarm of the fire was admirably done. The smoke and the shouting were enough to shake nerves of steel. She responded beautifully. The photograph is in a recess behind a sliding panel just to the right of the fireplace. She was there in an instant, and I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I cried out that it was a false alarm, she replaced it, glanced at the smoke rocket, rushed from the room, and I have not seen her since. I rose and made my excuses and escaped from the house. Uh, I hesitated whether to attempt to secure the photograph at once, but the coachman had come in, and as he was watching me narrowly, it seemed safer to wait. And now? Ah, and now our quest is practically finished. I shall call on her with the king tomorrow, and with you if you care to come along. We will be shown into the sitting room to wait for the lady but it is probable that she will find neither us nor the photograph when she comes. It might be a satisfaction to his majesty to regain it with his own hands. Now, where are my keys? Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Who was that? Well, I think it was that young lad, the one disappearing around that corner. I've heard that voice before. Now I wonder who the deuce that could have been. I arrived early at Baker Street the next day, in time for breakfast. And we were engaged upon our toast and coffee when the Prince of Bohemia rushed into the room. You've really got it. Not yet. That you have hopes? I have hopes. Then tell me I am all impatient. Not so fast. There is something you must know first. And what is that? Irene Adler is married. Married? When? Yesterday. But to whom? To an English lawyer named Norton. Ah, but she could not love him. I am in hopes that she does. And why is that? because it would save your majesty all fear of future annoyance. If the lady loves her husband, she does not love your majesty. If she does not love your majesty, there is no reason why she should interfere with your majesty's plan. Ah, it is true, and yet, well, I wish that she would have been a woman of my own lay station, but a queen she would have made it. Ah, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. What is it, Holmes? It is, uh, it is from her. From Irene? Open it, Holmes, open it. Quick, read it aloud. Uh, oh, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. You took me in completely. Until after the alarm of fire, I had not a suspicion. But then, when I found how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I had been warned against you months ago. I had been told that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. And yet, with all this, you made me reveal what you wanted to know. Even after I became suspicious, I found it hard to think evil of such a dear, kind old clergyman. 
But, you know, I have been trained as an actress myself. Male costume is nothing new to me. I sent John the coachman to watch you, ran upstairs, got into my walking clothes, as I call them, and came down just as you departed. Well, I followed you to your door, and so made sure that I was really an object of interest to the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then I rather imprudently wished you good night and went off to see my husband. We both thought our best resource was flight when pursued by so formidable an antagonist. So you will find the nest empty when you call tomorrow. As to the photograph, your client may rest in peace. I love and am loved by a better man than he. The prince may do what he will without hindrance from one whom he has cruelly wronged. I keep it only to safeguard myself and to preserve a weapon which will always secure me from any steps he might take against me in the future. I send you this photograph instead, which he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, yours very truly, Irene Norton, nay Adler. The photograph? There is only this. Oh, it is she. Yes, and she is alone. Donna Wood Cannonin! What a woman! What a woman! Did I not tell you how quick and resolute she was? Ah, would she not have made an admirable queen? It is a pity that she was not of my level. From what I have seen of the lady, she seems indeed to be on a very different level to your majesty. I am sorry that I have not been able to bring your majesty's business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir, nothing could be more successful. I know that her word is inviolable. Ah, oh, the ladder is as safe as it were in the fire. I am glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Pray tell me in what way I can reward you. This emerald ring, perhaps, or perhaps a title? Your majesty has something which I should value even more highly. You have but to name it. This photograph. A ring's photograph? <laughs> Certainly, if you wish it. I thank you, Your Majesty. And then, there is no more to be done in the matter. I have the honor to wish you a very good morning. And that was how a great scandal threatened to affect the Kingdom of Bohemia, and how the best plans of Mr. Sherlock Holmes were bested by a woman's wit. He used to make merry over the cleverness of women, but I have not heard him do it of late. And when he speaks of Irene Adler, or when he refers to her photograph, it is always under the honorable title of The Woman. That was Sherlock Holmes and The Woman based on A Scandal in Bohemia by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Adapted for audio by Gretelyn Darkey. Directed by Gretelyn Darkey and produced by Thomas Marinchek. The cast, in order of appearance, was Dennis Jers as Dr. Watson, Paul Fox as Sherlock Holmes, Asher Yachts as the Grand Duke of Bohemia, and Carolyn Jers as Irene Adler, with Gretelyn Darkey as Mrs. Hudson. Foley and sound design by Joseph Adams and Jacob Gorsuch. Original music composed by Gretelyn Darkey and mastered by Joseph Adams. A production of We Are One Body Audio Theater.